Oh man, something I thought that we would never say for the rest of our time. We're we're really happy on a Saturday. Oh man, we are actually smiling on a Saturday. Let's go. You are locked on Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Spartans is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That is $150. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked on Spartans listeners, I have not been floating like this on a Saturday in quite some time. And I'm sure you haven't either. Look, the Nebraska win. That was fun. We had a good time. Good for the boys. Good for the green and white to finally chalk up a win in the victory column in, in Big Ten play. But guys, what what a heater we are on here at Michigan State. Uh, our hockey team gets a number one win over Wisconsin. They are 9-3-1 and one to start their season. The MSU women's soccer team, they are off to the Sweet 16. Michigan State, they just... They, they don't just beat Butler on Friday. They absolutely roll Butler. It was, for the most part, stress-free on Friday. We'll get to that game here in a little bit in the third segment. But, man, oh, man, first, got to talk about the game of the day. Michigan State, your football playing Spartans, 24, and those Indiana Hoosiers, 21. In a very ugly game. In a game that you would have to be somewhat sick in the head to actually spend your Saturday and watch on Big Ten Network. But hey, we're not going to claim mental sanity over here. Of course we watched it. Of course we had a hoot and a half. And who cares if a bowl game might not be in play? Or is it? We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Who cares if that's all out the door? We were living and dying with every single play in this game. Let's talk about the stars right off the bat here. I got two that I got to name. They're both pass catchers. The first one is the man that brought Michigan State up to 24 points, Malik Carr. A little bit of an absence here. Disciplinary absence, of course. Then he also had some injury issues this season. And point blank, it's kind of been an underwhelming season for Malik Carr, a guy that's entered this season with a lot of hype around him. A lot of coaches speaking very highly of him as well. But boy, howdy. Whoa, man. Uh, if an NFL scout... Just watched this game, and only this game, eight catches, 88 yards. Very often was he the bailout guy on third downs, the sure hand Mr. Reliable, if you will, to keep the chains moving. And, of course, the game-winning touchdown where poor number 20 on Indiana, I, I thought he was just going to combust spontaneously on that tackle attempt. If you just looked at all of that and only that today, I mean, Malik Carr's going in the in the top 20 of the first round of the NFL draft. I mean, that looked like the Malik Carr we've been waiting for. So, hey, better late than never. What a coming up game for Malik Carr. And, God, I, I was just quite bluntly doesn't win that game without Malik Carr. And how about, speaking of highlight reel catches, Montori Foster. What in the world? I, 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 that... <laughs> The one-handed, break two tackles, break a third tackle, find my way into the end zone touchdown was the best Michigan State touchdown since when? I actually asked that question, too, on Twitter, and many of you guys had some great responses, like Burbridge against Penn State. Uh, someone just actually had a very recent one as well. Tom wrote in Tyrell Henry versus Central Michigan. That was an unreal catch as well. But LJ Scott versus Iowa. Jaden Reed mossing a guy against Penn State. Or, hey, take your pick of any five touchdowns against Michigan. There are a lot of good options, but, man, uh, this that was the best play that we've seen so far this season, in my opinion. The Tyrell Henry catch was amazing too, but man, I, just not only the catch, but everything that he had to do after that grab, I, Michigan State clearly doesn't win that game without it. So yes, two much performances from the skill position players. And also let's talk about, not, not the sexiest position, unless you're a Michigan State fan, the punter, Ryan Eckley. Four punts, average more than 50 yards, and three of those punts found their way nestled inside the 15-yard line, including that one that was down at the one-yard line by Alante Brown. Hey, punting and field position were a major factor in this game. So, yeah, we got to tip our cap to Ryan Eckley, a guy that when we went into the season, 
I don't know if I was all too positive about it. We just saw Bryce Berenger, the best punter in the nation, leave. Obviously, there was going to be a drop-off. I thought it was going to be a pretty steep drop-off. Ryan Eckley, for the most part, has proven me wrong there. I, that, that is a strong punting performance yet again. I feel like we're talking about Ryan Eckley plenty of times. So, Also, the running backs as well. Yes, Nathan Carter, he's hurt. Who knows for how long, but uh, Jaron Mangum as well. Not just on the ground. His numbers weren't that flashy when getting the ball handed off to him, but the pass-catching aspect that he brought to this game as well with five catches, I mean, the, the, you talk about a guy that has lost a lot of time out there with some injuries. It was nice to see Jaron Mangum not just back, but back doing what he does best. Now, what does this mean for the season? It's Silly Saturday, everyone. That's right. We're going to entertain this conversation because, in theory – MSU could be playing for a bowl game on Black Friday next week against Penn State. And believe me, I know that just asking for a win against Penn State is a lot. However, for Michigan State to qualify for a bowl game, you're going to have to have a lot more happen. Now, why am I talking about this, about a 4-7 and seven team? Don't you need six wins to be bowl eligible? Well, sure, most years. But this year could be a little special because, hey, of the 80-some bowl slots that are available, there might not be that many six win teams when the dust settles on this regular season. And sure, some of those spots are going to be taken up by James Madison and Jacksonville State. But Brett, if I could talk, Brett McMurphy tweeted out beforehand that there could be spots for two, three, or four teams that are five and seven at the end of the year. We're going to bl uh, break this out, blow this out during the week here. We're going to give you the rooting guide as we go into this Penn State game. But just know that th there is a sliver of hope and what Michigan State can also hang their hat on is what are these tiebreakers for five and seven teams to get into the Cure Bowl or the Independence Bowl or the Surf Pro Bowl? It's APR scores. How well you did in the classroom the year before, Michigan State is tied for 28th in the nation. And ahead of them, I know that we just said they're only going to take two, three, or four, or five, and seven teams, but ahead of them are a lot of teams that are already bowl eligible to begin with. So cross your fingers if you want hope on a, on a sweet – Independence Bowl game in Shreveport, Louisiana to look forward to. So, yeah, there we go. Now, of course, after every game, we got to talk about, you know, not just all the sunny things that happened. Also, you know, what, what happened that wasn't so great. And a lot of this is just reruns of what we have seen throughout, you know, weeks past. Like, oh, no, a fourth and one went wrong. Drink. Uh, it's looking like D-Day out there yet again with, it seemed like, 25 Michigan State Spartan players getting injured. I don't even know how many healthy guys are going to be available for this Friday game, but yeah, yet again, bodies everywhere, some drink, uh, and yeah, insane late game coaching decisions. Uh, like when Indiana's driving and we're doing a zero blitz with no safety help and leaving Chester Kimbra out there by himself on his island, which maybe could have been pass interference at the end of the game there, but hey, we're not going to say that out loud, and who cares what I think in the end? That was kind of an insane move. For no safety help whatsoever, got away with one there. But, hey, luckily, Indiana and that great intentional grounding, that, that helped things a little bit more. It was just really just two brutal teams kind of duking it out with one another. But, uh, hey, another thing, too, a great play overturn on a, a simple penalty, like that Malik Carr touchdown grab did not count. Illegal shift, go ahead and drink, just something you can count on for Michigan State all the time. However, this is something we don't talk about ever, ever, after every single game. Kaden Hauser. We're going to talk about our quarterback here because three touchdown passes. That's nice. One of them was kind of that miracle grab by Montori Foster. We're going to give Montori more credit than the pass thrower on that one. But a lot of passes sailed. Two bad picks. Um, and also, let's just talk about this too. How the game started with the Nick Samak incident. I mean, look, we we're, I'll put a bow on the throwing things. I think simply put, with what we've seen so far this year, especially against a bad Indiana team, not a great secondary, what those two interceptions were all about, I think it's safe to say that the floor with Caden is a little lower than what we all thought. Now, I'm not going to call it over and say that he should leave. He needs to go to some Division II school and finish his career out there. Like, no, he's a redshirt freshman at the end of all this. Let's you know pay attention to that. And, hey, let's say that we get a coach in here that can – actually develop a quarterback, that'd be pretty cool. There's a lot of career left for him and a high ceiling for him as well. But yeah, kind of an eh start to his year. But man, one thing that I do want to point out that really just made me arch an eyebrow is the whole Nick Samak situation, how the game started where 
Not it, it's one thing to miss the wide open receiver. Okay, like that that happens. Whatever. It's another thing to miss your footing when you're scrambling out of the pocket. It, it's another thing to roll up on your teammate. It's a, it was a very uncomfortable visual to see the quarterback who just rolled up on his senior offensive lineman, potentially ending his career. And it turned out after the game that he did break his leg. Odd to not go over to that lineman and just see how he's doing. Give a, give a, my bad to him. Or as the training staff is sprinting out to at least be in that huddle to see like, Hey, sorry about that, man. Kane, I was a great kid. Look, I, by all accounts, he's an awesome kid. I'm not going to let that one moment just be a detriment to his character or anything. But like when that happens, it's like, Oh, okay. We're going to work on like, maybe just, just leadership ability. Here. I don't know. That was a very odd, uncomfortable start to the game here. And uh, obviously goes without saying a horrendous way for Nick Samek to end his career. And it's been said after the game that he's broken his leg, which sucks because, you know, Nick Samek, you know, he was one of the rocks that you can count on for this team. Really tough kid. <sighs> and this, this, and that. So yeah, just, just, just a true bummer for Nick Samek's end of his career. We're going to get to another fun topic the coaching search because Spartans illustrated, they dropped another bomb on Friday when it comes to this coaching search that could be wrapping up here in the next 10 or so days, guys. But first need to talk your ear off about a new friend. It's listening.com college students. You guys, especially listen up. There's an incredible app called listening.com, which can take any academic paper, PDF or class material and turn it into an audio book. It can read math equations, technical words and complicated documents. It knows to skip all the citations, footnotes and references, all that junk that you don't need to hear out loud and lets you jump straight to the chapter or section you want to listen to. And let's say you're not a college student. Let's just say you're like me. You want to read up on work, some PDFs, or just even like a, some literature that you find enjoyable. If you're like me and you are the world's slowest reader, you're going to love listening.com. It has everything, just one click of a button, and it will automatically take you to the last 10 seconds into the notepad so you don't have to type notes while you listen. Best of all, if you use the link listening.com slash locked on. That's right. Listening.com slash locked on. You'll be able to get your first three weeks for free. So go ahead give it a try. Usually it's two weeks free, but Hey, you know what? With listening.com slash locked on, we're giving you that third week for free. So go to listening.com slash locked on and let's dive headfirst into the coaching search here because man, Spartans illustrated. They did it again. That's right. David Harnes, Ryan O'Blennis, the whole gang over there. They were able to confirm that four coaches have moved on to the second round of interviews. Now, we're going to say this before going any further. These are not the final four candidates. These may not even be the top four candidates. These were just the four names that Sparns Illustrated can confirm that after an initial Zoom call, we'll be back for round two of interviews. So, I'll stop blabbing. I'll give you the names. It's Mike Elko, 46-year-old head coach from Duke. It is Jed Fish, the 47-year-old head coach from Arizona. It is Jonathan Smith from Oregon State and then Jason Candle from Toledo as well. Guys, I know we like Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer's my top guy on my wish list. He's my tier one guy. I've said that up and down. You're probably so sick of hearing about it. I, I want Urban. But guys, let's start to set into reality here that Urban most likely is not going to be coming here. Let's just say, hypothetically, like we should have originally, that three or four weeks ago when Urban Meyer said that he has no interest in coaching, that we should have just taken his word for it, that we should have just believed him. Let's say that we actually did trust Urban Meyer when he said that three or four weeks ago. And I'm guilty of it, too. I heard him say that and said, ah, uh, coaches always say that. But let's act like that. No, that, that is something that he actually said truthfully. This would be a great list of four names, guys. I'm not saying this to you with green stained glasses. I'm not trying to push propaganda out there that, oh, no, you must believe this because go green. I love Michigan State more than anything. They can never do any run. We can do a lot run here. We can do a lot bad. These names, at least these names, this is pretty good, guys. Look around. I know the Texas A&M job has an opening. I know for some reason that Danny's name keeps being connected to it. I don't think it's going to happen. You will find that the engine search is not too far off as far as star power goes. That's one right here. Yeah, they have a Lane Kiffin. That's because Lane Kiffin, I think, always wants to be in the S. So as far as realistic names go, guys, this is this is a good 
situation for Michigan to be in right now. Let's just start with my top guy right here on this list. In my tier two, like I said, better players my tier one guy, but the more realistic tier two, Mike Elko probably lead off. And there he is. Took a while to get confirmed that he was in the mix because if you remember the initial Spartans story, had six names. Mike Elko was not one they could confirm, but here he is confirmed as getting a second interview here at Michigan State. So why is he my top guy? Well, he has Midwest ties. He has really has ties to the whole entire eastern part of the country. Defensive mind he's always had as a defensive coordinator at Texas A&M. Top 35 defenses there. Had his defense up to number nine overall in 2020. He went nine and four in his first year at Duke. And he did not inherit some great Power 5 program just laced with talent. Like, no. The recruiting classes he inherited before that were, like, in the high 50s, low 60s. So that's the talent pool he has to deal with. And he's going 9-4. and four. This season, okay, it's been a decent season. He did lose his starting quarterback. I'm, I'm sorry for making that excuse. It seems to me that your star quarterback being gone for the season might have an impact on what you do. But on the recruiting trail, he has Duke 35th overall in the nation for next year. And I know it's not a flashy number. That's not top 12 or top 15. But the theme with a lot of these guys is achieving way more than you are given. Like Duke does not have the resources that a lot of these other programs have. Michigan State's resources, much more plentiful than what you would find at Duke. So yes, 35th ranked recruiting class at Duke. It's kind of amazing. That's that's actually pretty good here. So that is Mike Elko, my top guy. Jed Fish, another guy that I'd be totally fine with. 47 years old. We talked a little bit about him at a previous episode, actually. Seven and three on the season so far. And at the time of record, uh, uh, if I could talk today, my goodness. At the time of recording, they are up 28 0 on Utah. So well on their way to eight and three right now. This guy has been everywhere in college and in pro. He's been at Minnesota collegiately, UCLA. He's also been at Michigan. And no, don't think that we're hiring a Michigan man. This is a guy that spent two seasons there as like the passing game coordinator. It's not like we're hiring Bo Schembechler's son or anything. Like, I believe me, I'm a little, you know, eh, when it comes to like hiring people from Michigan, th th this would not be one of them. He had two cups of coffee there and that's it. He's also worked for the Rams, the Patriots. He is a good recruiter. He had Arizona as a top 25 class last year, which again, we're going to talk about resources again. Where Arizona stacks up nationally with resources and just funds and all that fun stuff, they should never, ever have a top 25 class out there in Arizona, but he was able to get it done. Solid recruiter. And also, hey, this man could develop a quarterback. All right. Like that is his bread and butter right there. When you have two young quarterbacks right now that might be going into the offseason here at Michigan State with Sam Levin, Kenton Hauser. I wouldn't hate the top guy being a quarterback mind as well. Now, Jonathan Smith, he is another guy as well. And when I see Jonathan Smith's name confirmed for second round of interviews, don't let anyone tell you that this Michigan State job is not desirable, that this is just some, oh, this job is like an Indiana job, or, oh, you are Sparty. You guys are lower third nationally. Like, no, we knew that this would be a desirable job here in East Lansing. Jonathan Smith has proven that to you. He is in the run of an incredible season. Biggest game of the season against Washington on Saturday. He takes time to interview for the Michigan State job. And as many of you know, Jonathan Smith is an alum of Oregon State. So, yes, yes, Michigan State is a desirable job, guys. If you guys had any inkling as to, oh, man, maybe they're right, maybe we're not a good – no, people want to come here, guys. So what Jonathan Smith has done at Oregon State, he gets knocked for this a lot, how it took a while for him to build the Beavers program up to where they are. He did start 2-10, and 5-7, and 2-5, and 7-6, and six, and then finally last two years, 10-3, and three, and right now before kicking off against Washington, 8-2. and two. You hear me talk about this all the time. I'm going to echo a lot of what I already said about Arizona and Duke. There's no reason for Corvallis, Oregon to be the home of a top 15 program in college football. You talk lack of resources, and yes, they've had a good stadium renovation, stuff like that. But let the Pac-12 let you know what they think of what Oregon State can bring to the table. That's why everyone left. That's why everyone fleed. That's why no one wants them. That's why no one picked them up. But yet, here's Jonathan Smith. Having the Beavers cooking in Corvallis, Oregon. They've had one nine-win season in the last fifth years, guys, okay? Well, I'm sorry, one nine-win season before Jonathan Smith in the last 15 years. So, and Jason Candle, too, 
we'll be really quick on this just because we spent a lot of time on Jason Candle with Kyle Rowland of the Toledo Blade. But that's another guy, mid-40s, a good track record of success, supremely a Midwestern guy. He spent I mean, basically his whole career at Toledo after a good run at Mount Union. Ohio Roots, this, this, and that. They're 10-1 and one this year over there in Toledo. So that's your fourth guy as well. And I can name a lot worse options than this. So there you have it. Again, Spartans Illustrated, go subscribe there. They have been on top of this coaching search this entire time. And also the, the president search, too, if that tickles your fancy. I don't know if we'll ever get to talking about that here at Lockdown Spartans. That seems a little above our pay grade. But until, if, or when we do talk about that, Spartans Illustrated, go subscribe to the fine folks over there. We will be back to talk some shooty hoops here because, hey, one win down the season and one win down the season. How about one win down this weekend? One more to go on Sunday. But first, need to talk your ear off about fan, duel, sportsbook, gang. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. If you're like me and you love the Lions tomorrow, minus 10 against the Bears, Go for it. Go for it on FanDuel Sportsbook. Or, hey, better yet, if you are a new customer, you get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. So you don't even need to lay down 10 points at the Lions are. If you love the Lions against the Bears tomorrow, you're a new customer, just bet $5 on them to win outright, and you are going to receive $150 in bonus bets if the Lions pull off the victory, whether it's by one point, whether it's by 51 points. That's how easy it is. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and so much more, including my personal favorite, first-time touchdown score. So what are you waiting for, gang? Visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and kick off the NFL season. It's FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. And let's switch up sports here. If you guys are looking for hockey coverage, it's going to come this week. We have Jeremy Dewar of Spartans Illustrated lineup to talk about just everything great going on with Adam Nightingale's program so far this season. So, yes, I know that there is some hunger out there for hockey talk. It's going to come this week. Don't, don't you worry during Turkey Week here. I can't believe it's, I can't believe it's Thanksgiving here coming up here. Guys, Friday almost had me emotional watching a game of basketball because um, for the first time this season, unless you really got fired up after that Southern Indiana uh, game, we got to watch a good chunk of the game with our shoulders, not at our ears because we're just so anxious of what's going to happen. They took care of Butler in just about a mostly stress-free game. And my favorite part of the game on Friday is just how senior driven this was. AJ Hogard. Thank you for finally showing up, A.J. Hogard. You do exist. You are here. 14 points, 6 rebounds, 4 assists. Or I'm sorry, maybe it's 6 assists, 4 rebounds. Regardless, 14, 6, and 4. And you cannot quantify this with an analytic. You cannot find this in the box score. Maybe this is a supremely meatball head take. But here it comes. He played with fire on Friday. And that's what we like to see. That's what was really irritating early on against James Madison is that he was so passive. The body language wasn't the most positive. And no, I'm not a new Michigan State fan. I know this is what you get with A.J. Hogard. You get some swings down low where it's like, does he even want to be here? Does he want to be literally anywhere else but a basketball court right now? And then, well, you see the two-week, three-week stretches that he has where it looks like he would just about literally commit murder on the court if it meant that his team could get a win. And we started to see that, especially in the second half against Butler. So, yes, AJ, let's keep on riding this wave. He was aggressive. Again, played with fire. Him and Pierre Brooks might not like each other. I think that it was mostly a clean split with Pierre Brooks and Michigan State. Perhaps not with those two guys, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Let's get to talking about our Michigan State Spartans some more. Tyson Walker, just a classic ho-hum, 21 points. And just on one three-pointer, too, he was getting it done in many other ways and just behind the arc. And then Malik Hall, 12 points, nine rebounds, and also three steals as well. So, yes, I know it wasn't the greatest start to the season for Malik Hall, and I don't think it helps that our last memory of last season of Malik Hall is the mishaps that he had against Kansas State. I think people were a little too hard on him, but that's neither here nor there. Strong bounce back game for Malik Hall. He had that turnaround jumper going really early. And let's talk about a guy that's not a senior because we got to talk about Coop, Carson Cooper, your new starting center 
I hope that wasn't an experiment that Tom Izzo was doing of just seeing like, hey, how does it look with him in the starting rotation? I think it benefited both centers greatly here. Goes without saying for Carson Cooper. I mean, yes, he only had two shots, just made one of them, but he had his impact made by the boards. 11 rebounds, four of them offensive rebounds, active hands too. So Strawn, Strawn first start of the season for Carson Cooper as well. I also thought Mahdi had a really nice moment as well. And not that I thought that the game was ever in danger in the second half, but Michigan State had a pretty comfortable lead at halftime. They saw it get chopped down to eight. And the first six minutes, not a lot of fire, not a lot of juice or cohesion for Michigan State, but that all changed when on one end of the floor, Mati Sissoko gets on the ground, scraps for the loose ball, gets it, and then on the Michigan State possession that follows it, he grabs the offensive rebound. That turns into two points. You could say that's a four or five point swing right there, but it definitely brought the life back to Michigan State and they just coasted the rest of the way. So good outing for Mati Sissoko off the bench. Again, I think that's where he needs to come off. If you've listened to the show for even five seconds when we talk basketball, you know that's where I stand on Madi. It's just a tough-ish night for all freshmen. I mean, it wasn't anything detrimental, obviously, in a 20-point win. You didn't need them, but Cohen Carr, 11 minutes. Had some freshman mistakes out there. Uh, Xavier Booker, just six minutes. Yes, he did splash a three-pointer home when the game was already, what, a 16-point game at the end there. And then Jeremy Fears, just an ad game, but he did – Hit a three-pointer there, and the jump shot is something that we're going to be watching for here with Jeremy Fears. Like, yes, he does push the pace very well. He is dynamic. He's at McDonald's All-American, this, this, and that. But it would be nice if we see in a little bit of an offensive contribution from him. And maybe that jump shot kind of gets something going here. I don't know. One, all, one other uh, shot that we have to mention, too, is that Trey Holloman, after saying that, like, does he offer anything offensively? Here he goes, just splashes a three-pointer right in my face right after that episode after the Duke game. So coming up on Sunday, it's Alcorn State. Guys, I don't know another way to put it other than if, if Michigan State doesn't win this game by at least 25 points, we can be back to being a little bit concerned. Alcorn State in their starting lineup, their tallest guy, six foot seven. This is going to be a small ball kind of game should Michigan State want to go that way or – if they just want to have Carson Cooper and Mati Sissoko go ham against Alcorn State's front court, by all means, it, it, now is the best time to, quote, get anything going offensively out of those guys than ever. So, But again, I, Alcorn State, 1-3 and three this season. They're actually in the midst of 11 straight road non-conference games. They are funding their athletic department through all of these games. Not great. Like I said, one and three. Their only win is against, I think it's like Xavier of Louisiana or something like that. I, just, some school you've never heard of in your entire life. They did. They did almost beat UAB. That's a name that we know. Lost to them by three. They were leading them by, I think, 11 in the second half. But, yeah, it's this should be a stress-free win on Sunday, guys. But, hey. One we could smile about, hopefully. I will knock on wood here, just in case you guys are worried about that jinx here. But, yeah, Alcorn State. Sunday night, we will do like a short episode after that, probably nothing longer than 10 minutes. Unless they lose, then we will do two hours straight of screaming myself hoarse. But under the situation where they win, uh, don't expect like a full-blown episode after that. It'll be a short one here. Let's just swim in the comment section right now. Let's just see what you guys have going on here. Elko Kocha a and I would guess they are going to make a good offer to him if interested. That is the interesting thing about Elko is that it is confirmed that he interviewed with Michigan State, but not a and That is yet to be confirmed. So that was really the biggest eyebrow raiser for me when I'm reading the Spartans Illustrated article. I was like, oh, even though he knows the AM job is open, he's picking us like right now. So that could all change. Yes, you can interview with two places at the same time, keep all of your options open. But yeah, I, I don't know if he does want to go back to a &M, which would be something because I'm sure they're going to offer all sorts of money. But yeah, I mean, guys, there you have it. This is, this is crazy that the comment section after a win on Saturday is about a tenth of what it usually is after a loss where everyone is just demanding everyone be fired, tarred and feathered, put on trial. This is fun. This is fun. I'm sorry. Sea Dog also wrote in that I saw today Fish denied interviewing for the job. There's going to be a lot of that, too, with head coaches. This is going to shock a lot of people here. Head coaches lie sometimes when they're caught to be interviewing other places. 
Rivals, I think like triple or quadruple source this. I, I'm going to take Sparns Illustrated's word that Jetfish uh, interviewed for this job. I know some things behind the scenes too that make me really think that is uh, what happened as well. But yeah, guys, just like we remembered, Mel Tucker tweeted out, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying at Colorado. And then what happened less than 24 hours later, he was on a private jet to East Lansing to sign that contract. Like it's coaches lie a lot. So no, I'm sorry. No offense to Jed Fish, especially if you're going to be our future head coach. Love you. Respect you. I don't trust a damn word you're saying right now. So that goes with any coach that is confirmed to be going into round two of interviews. All right, guys, I will stop blabbing. Oh, sorry, Doug. You wrote in no Lance Leipold on that list. He was not confirmed to have a second interview again. That doesn't mean that he isn't in the interview process. They just couldn't actually confirm it. They couldn't get into his camp or the agent's camp or the school's camp. So it is possible that Lance Leipold is still under consideration. And when do I think the decision will be made? That is a good question by Illis Eggplant. I've long said that I think it will come out Thanksgiving week. So I think we are really, really on the five-yard line of this, guys. This isn't inside information. This is just me spitballing. But the coaches that they're after – I don't think we'll be coaching in a conference championship game unless maybe Oregon State gets it done. But effectively, the coaches' regular seasons will be ending this Saturday. And with the way news works, leaks work, I wouldn't be surprised to hear something by like Wednesday or Thursday. That's just a hunch. Again, I cannot stress that enough that I'm just throwing something on the wall and I'm going to see if it sticks. But I will think that sometimes late this week. So there you have it. I would be interested in Jimbo Fisher here at MSU. I told myself I'd log off right now. We are going to address that right now. Jimbo Fisher had recruiting classes whose salary caps rivaled some NFL teams, and he still couldn't get anything done at Texas A&M. He had a treasure chest of recruits brought his way, and he was able to do nothing with it. So much so that he was paid $76 million to no longer coach at Texas A&M. That's how big of a fan's the Aggies were with Jimbo Fisher. They scrounged together $76 million for him never to coach again. Also, now that he has $76 million, I would be floored if Jimbo Fisher is perusing the classified sections looking for another job right now. That man has won the lottery. He has the best job in the entire world right now, which is a fired college football coach. We don't need him here. And he certainly doesn't need to be anywhere else. So that's where I'm going to stand on the Jimbo Fisher thing. This man could not coach with top flight talent at AM. It was cool a decade ago when he was doing it with Florida State, but time has changed. And I stand uh, with Chip Kelly on that too. Anyway, I love you guys. You guys are the best. Thanks a lot for uh, spending some of your Saturday with us here or your Sunday, whatever day you guys are going to choose to listen to this. You guys are truly the best. Now let's go enjoy a Michigan State basketball game on Sunday. Love you all. Go green.